tragedy. What a heartbreaker. The sprays of blood, the smell of singed hair, the viscera. Oh, the viscera. Yeah, that would be the new Suicide Squad content. And for a game that has some of the most famous DC heroes and villains ever, you would think that it's experiencing massive success. Uh, it's not. <laughs> to be a little bit more specific, the game currently has around a thousand players on Steam. It's not even in the top 50 most played Xbox games. And uh, yeah, Warner Brothers has already pretty much said that this game failed to meet their expectations. And right now the reception of this new Joker content has not been pretty from the uh, gaming community. As this Polygon article says, more grind, less story, and little hope for the future. It said the Joker has about uh, less than six minutes of cutscenes, doesn't even have an interaction with Harley Quinn, which is just hilarious in my opinion and yeah the community an insult to the remaining player base remaining is uh, the keyword here and the fact that people are calling it worse than avengers kind of says a lot but don't worry as warner brothers has learned the right lessons right uh no, they, they plan to double down on live services. It definitely sounds like the uh, future Hogwarts Legacy 2 will inevitably have some live service elements. This company just does not understand that the community gamers do not want this nonsense, but yet they're going to continue down this road. But before we proceed forward, today's video is sponsored by AFK Journey, the innovative ethereal fantasy RPG available on iOS, the Google Play Store, and PC is free to play. The game boasts a unique art style, complex gameplay systems, and an added layer with PC compatible side scrolling elements. In the magical land of Asperia from Golden Wheatshire to the Veduso Mountains, you'll embark on a quest as Merlin, gathering heroes across six factions while diving into an unexplored world full of hidden mystery waiting to be unlocked. Assemble the ultimate hero lineup, strategize and create winning battlefield tactics to conquer each and every challenge presented. Explore a vast world solving fun puzzles and meet complex and interesting NPCs with effortless one-handed gameplay. With AFK Journey's official release, all heroes can be obtained for free, including epics. Additionally, players will receive at least 200 free pulls by progressing through the game and completing events like a 7-day login. Download AFK Journey today by following my link down in the description below and use my CD key AFK Journey 88 to get 100 diamonds and 18,888 golden coins. Thank you again to AFK Journey for sponsoring this video. IGN gave Resident Evil 5 a glowing review back in the day. Today, they're against a remake being made most Mostly because they're uncomfortable with playing as a white guy shooting black zombies in Africa. Not, not even joking, that's pretty much the article. Top-notch journalism if I have to say so myself. Crystal Dynamics last month put a warning label on the older Tomb Raider games because they're quote-unquote containing offensive depictions of cultures rooted in prejudices and they believe the stereotypes are harmful and inexcusable. Better than removing the content, I suppose, but Compulsion Games, Canadian devs behind We Happy Few, jumped in supporting the label and called on remakes and remasters of other classic games to be made for modern audiences and to rewrite new history. <laughs> Well, this may not come as a shock, but a community manager of that same company has sparked outrage with previous remarks attacking gamers and specifically in 2022, saying in an interview that white male gamers were a mistake. I'm certain that Xbox will come out and condemn these remarks, right? That's sarcasm, of course they won't. Especially as an executive got slammed for making similar remarks in a now-deleted tweet just the other day. The gaming industry is on fire right now. From the whole sweet baby drama, to broken unfinished remasters sold at a premium, to the continuing mass layoffs which has seen thousands of developers without jobs, to the hissy fit the reset era gaming forums and gaming websites are having over Stellar Blade's sexy character design. IGN France even jumped in condemning the game by saying the game's protagonist is bland. A doll sexualized by someone who has never seen a woman. It's worth mentioning that the character was scanned after a real woman. In terms of big gaming acquisitions, the last couple weeks there's been some very noteworthy ones, specifically coming from the Embracer Group, which is right now having a fire sale as the company is going down in flames. They sold Saber Interactive for about $250 million, and that also included the Metro devs at 4A Games. But, there's a huge but, 4A Games did not retain the rights to the Metro franchise that stayed with the Embracer Group. Fortunately, it does seem like 4A Games will continue to work on the next Metro game, but 
that relationship. It's not in the hands of 4A Games anymore, which is very unfortunate. But one partnership which does make a lot of sense is the fact that the Embracer Group sold Borderlands Devs Gearbox to Rockstar parent company Take-Two Interactive for just under $500 million. This is a relationship that just makes a ton of sense because a lot of people thought that Gearbox already was owned by Take-Two Interactive because of their relationship on Borderlands. So nothing too shocking here. They did. Uh, there was a couple of noteworthy things that stayed with the Embracer Group, such as the Remnant series. But Borderlands being in 2K games is control. Just it makes sense. CD Projekt Red is preparing for work on the next Witcher game. Specifically, right now they have about two thirds of the company working on The Witcher 4. We still don't, don't exactly have a great idea on the direction that they're going to be taking with the sequel. It doesn't seem like Geralt of Rivia will be the protagonist. But is it going to be Ciri, a new protagonist, a Vesemir? We'll have to see. But work does continue on that. We're probably still a couple of years away. But the company did come out saying something that was very eye-opening, at least to some people, and also some people just rolled their eyes at it, was CD Projekt Red's CFO saying that they don't see microtransactions in single-player games, which is a nice thing to hear, but... A lot of people just don't trust these executives because of, well, everything that happened with Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, during an interview, he said, We do not see a place for microtransactions in the case of single-player games, but we do not rule out that we will use this solution in the future in the case of multiplayer projects, which is pretty pretty obvious stuff. But a lot of people don't trust CD Projekt Red, and these remarks kind of just went through one ear through the other. Now, it is also worth mentioning the timing of these remarks coming when Dragon's Dogma 2 from Capcom uh, launched a mostly negative review after uh, microtransactions were revealed. It kind of came out of the middle of nowhere, and a lot of people were extremely upset by this. Uh, if you actually check the Steam reviews right now, it's still very mixed because of this. A lot of people not liking how the review process didn't mention any of this. Some reviewers seem to have gotten some indication that this was going to be happening, while many others did not. But if you check the... This, this is what I mean. It's it's a ton of microtransactions, a lot of stuff that many players have said it's pretty much useless, you don't need to bother with this stuff, but the fact that it is there is bothersome. We've seen that this industry in the past has altered game design to steer players to microtransactions like this, specifically Ubisoft. So this is definitely dangerous territory, and this is why I always have issues with microtransactions like this in the first place. But it is worth mentioning, like I said, PC Gamer put out an article saying that they're baffingly silly since nearly all of them can be found in the game without too much trouble. And uh, I do want to mention, again, it's just rather interesting. A couple of months ago, Capcom came out very much against mods. And, uh, you know, when you see stuff like this, it definitely makes you wonder why they're so against mods. And their argument at the time was that they were offensive to public order and morals. So make of that as you will. Now... Grand Theft Auto 6 is the hotly anticipated, the most anticipated game maybe of all time. And there's been some recent eye-opening news coming in regards to when the game's going to be releasing, but also some of the stuff that's happening behind the scenes at Rockstar Games. This article coming from Bloomberg's Jason Schreier, Grand Theft Auto maker Rockstar Games, asks workers to return to office five days a week. Uh, Rockstar Games, a division of Take-Two, will ask employees to return to the office five days a week beginning in April as the video game makers enter the final stages of development on its next game, the hotly anticipated Grand Theft Auto 6. In an email to staff on Wednesday, reviewed by Bloomberg, Rockstar head of publishing Jen Kolb said the decision was made for productivity and security reasons. You know, those massive leaks and stuff that happened about a year or two ago, still right on Rockstar's mind. They're still very upset that that happened, and they want to make sure nothing else gets out, but it inevitably will. Uh, Kolb wrote that the company also found tangible benefits from in-person work. Making these changes now puts us in the best position to deliver the next Grand Theft Auto at the level of quality and polish we know it requires, along with a publishing roadmap that matches the scale and ambition of the game. And as you might expect, many gamers met this this you know this news kind of just scoffing at it like who cares you have to go back to work but a lot of developers at rockstar games felt very upset about this this article coming from aftermath rockstar employees concerned about crunch gta 6 as company moves forward with return to office a uk-based rockstar employees in conjunction with the independent workers union of great britain spoke out against the decision fearing an unnecessary hit to work-life balance that might end up proving a deal breaker for some working from home has been a lifeline for many 
many of us at Rockstar, allowing us to balance care responsibilities, manage disabilities, and relocate as we need. One Rockstar employee who chose to remain anonymous said in a statement from that union. And then speaking with Aftermath, two additional Rockstar employees said that little has changed since last month, even as the clock ticks to April. The only news I know of is some reports of some people being admonished to varying degrees of voicing disagreement with the RTO plan. But otherwise, we are just waiting for more information from management about how the hell this is going to work. And then further later, while Rockstar's exact approach to return to the office is still taking shape, workers have been informed that they're losing access to most forms of remote work, including communication tools. We won't be able to answer Slack messages and emails and stuff like that when we're at home anymore, which is a big, big loss because a lot of us work intercontinental, said one Rockstar employee. And then we had another article coming from Kotaku, which is pretty much the same thing. GTA 6 devs slam Rockstar games for return to office mandate, and, and within the article, it mentions an IGN report that developers of the studio are criticizing the company's decision. Uh, speaking to the publication anonymously, one employee said that working from home has been a lifeline for many of us, specifying that Rockstar Games needs to rethink their reckless decision making and engage with their staff to find solutions that work for everyone. Another anonymous employee said they fear having to work late hours in the office, which would mean developers would miss out on spending time with our families. And it has also been said in some other reports that developers feel like there could be many leaving the studio because of this return to office mandate and that veteran talent could cause issues with Grand Theft Auto 6's development as they are nearing the final stages of development. And there has been some other recent reports, specifically this one coming from Kotaku, saying that production on the game is falling behind as Rockstar is urging staff to return to office. And there has been some mixed messaging coming from this report from Kotaku. I take issue with it because I reached out to my own source, which said that development is going fine right now. Uh, the indication is that the game will be ready in time for 2025, whether that's early 2025 or later in 2025, it's unclear. From what I understand, it does seem like it's probably going to be in the later half, but we'll have to see what happens. Rockstar Games specifically has not given a date saying, you know, whether it's going to be earlier or late 2025. They just have that very broad 2025 date. Uh, within this article, again, they've also updated a couple of times, and they just mentioned the same things that I've gone over, and which, yeah, there is a lot of people upset about returning to office, and many developers considering leaving Rockstar Games over the decision. And Insider Gaming also published their own account, pretty much saying exactly what I said, that right now development is moving fine and nothing has changed within Rockstar Games yet and uh, Bloomberg's Jason Schreier has reported as much lately as well so right now Grand Theft Auto 6 a lot of anticipation behind it Rockstar Games is right now in their silence mode we probably won't be hearing much about this game until sometime in late summer or fall maybe with trailer number two but yeah work continues on Grand Theft Auto 6 there's a lot of developers very upset about this and it does seem like again this is going to be the most highly anticipated game of all time so making sure that this is perfect as possible come release day is important so if the game needs to be pushed back it will be and this is rockstar games we're talking about they have a reputation for this right now blizzard is suffering they have had a lot of chaos happening behind the scenes they just got some new competition from this NetEase game called marvel rivals which looks like almost an exact copycat of it and i definitely agree with this headline that it's probably going to fail but it is funny that we're seeing other developers almost just blatantly copying what they've done with overwatch now Overwatch 2 recently got some massive news in which, yeah, Blizzard just basically killed PvE completely, which is rather funny because this was the selling point of Overwatch 2 from the get-go. This was exactly what Blizzard laid out as their vision for why Overwatch 2 was even needed in the first place, and it went from they're going to have this giant PvE storyline and stuff to just there's going to be some missions to now it's, it's dead. So, as this article says, Blizzard has completely gutted its planned PvE content for Overwatch 2, and will instead double down on PvP. That's according to, again, a Bloomberg uh, newsletter and information that PC Gamer also corroborated separately. It's a disappointing conclusion to an 18-month wait, albeit one that's not all surprising, given last year's cancellation of the game's hero mode. And again, with that announcement, it was also said that a trio of co-op missions were released in June last year, a $15 price tag, yes, they charged people for that nonsense, and lack replayability didn't do much
much in the way of enticing players. And yeah, that price tag was something that players did not expect after the news. So again, all of this just not very surprising. Overwatch has not been doing very well, and Blizzard overall has not been doing very well. As many of you know, just about a month or so ago, it was announced that Blizzard's survival game that they were working on, New IP, was reportedly canceled over engine issues after six years of development. Just a lot of chaos happening inside of the walls of Blizzard. And then there was the massive announcement that Mike Ybarra, the president of Blizzard, was leaving the company, which is rather interesting because just about a month or two ago, he was taking photos with Phil Spencer on the campus of Blizzard, saying that he wanted to be here for years to come. And then there was the massive layoffs at Blizzard in which about hundreds of developers lost their job and then Yabara just jumped for the doors and it does appear that he's going to go work on some other stuff. Uh, this was probably to be expected after the Microsoft Activision Blizzard uh, acquisition as a lot of executives at Activision Blizzard had jumped, have jumped ship but still it's rather just eye-opening as we're seeing Blizzard continue to crumble and we have not seen yet any of that Microsoft leadership leading Blizzard or Activision to any sort of success and there's those question marks will remain into the future. Now Electronic Arts has also been in the news recently as there was some massive layoffs with about 700 developers fired and they also sunsetted various games and they were moving away from future licensed IP which is not surprising because Andrew Wilson the CEO of the company has made it pretty clear the last couple of years he just does not care for franchises like Star Wars. That was something that was inherited to him, and he just didn't like the investment that they were making into it. Obviously, right now, Respawn Entertainment is working on the third Jedi game, but after that, it seems to be it. There is some other projects in development, such as a Black Panther and Iron Man game. We'll see what happens with those projects into the future. Um, there was also a Mandalorian game in development, and that also appears to be now dead. So it does appear that Electronic Arts is just going to be doubling down on the franchises that they own, such as Battlefield, which has been chaotic the last decade. And that is mostly due to EA DICE and a lot of incompetency coming from the company. They've just not listened to gamers. They've tried to double down on the successful things happening in the shooter market instead of focusing on what people want from an actual Battlefield game, which is, you know, the Battlefield identity. They learned that lesson the hard way with Battlefield 2042. And right now, Battlefield continues to lose mass mass of uh, veteran talent. As this game developer article points out, Battlefield creative director Craig Morrison quietly departs EA for new studio, and there was also the announcement by EA that they were shutting down Battlefield developer Ridgeline Games, and that was accompanied by an outgoing Battlefield director saying he has nothing positive to say about Electronic Arts, that being the Halo co-creator Marcus Leto, who was leading the next campaign, and he was also again part of Ridgeline Games, and obviously he'd probably have some very angry feelings towards EA after they shut down his studio before they even produced anything. Now, Electronic Arts has been outlining some details about the future for Battlefield. The next game is aiming for the most realistic destruction effects in the industry, which doesn't say a lot because Battlefield had that a decade ago, and it seems like it's been downgraded for the last couple installments, which is kind of crazy, but them going back to that is great to hear. Insider Gaming also published an insider account about what's going on with the next Battlefield, and some of it sounds interesting, some of it not so much. Uh, insider Gaming has learned that the next Battlefield title is taking some of it a back to its roots approach, which is great to hear, with the likes of 64 player matches. Vince Zampella is now running EA Dice as far as I understand, so him going back to what Battlefield is known for, it just it makes sense, and he knows how to make great games, as we've seen with the success that he's had with Respawn Entertainment. Uh, the return of its four class system and an overhaul to its destruction systems. As for the game setting itself, it will be set in the modern day somewhere around 2020 to 2030 with a strong story driven emphasis on modern technology used in war. It continues Ripple Effect, the studio that is working on a new experience for the Battlefield franchise is working on a new Battle Royale title that's currently aimed to be free, free to play and follow a similar strategy to the highly successful Call of Duty Warzone that will see the free to play experience tie in with its premium release. Premium release. So they're following the strategy that has worked with for Call of Duty and I'm really not sure why Battlefield didn't do that earlier on. The news may come as a shock to some but past Battlefield third game mode experiences, including Battlefield 5's Battle Royale Firestorm, which was horrible, and Battlefield 2042's Hazard Zone, which again wasn't very good, missed huge opportunities with the titles not being free to play, although I think that was hardly the issues with those experiences, in my opinion. But regardless, Battlefield will have to wait until 2025 to see this next installment. Hopefully they can get this franchise back on track. I 
that I'm very skeptical about that. But Vincent Pella, he's now running the show. If there is anybody that can do it, it probably would be him. But right now, there is little indication, I guess you could say, of having too much hope with the Battlefield franchise, as it just feels like any time I get excited about these games, it just feels like EA Dice finds a way to screw it up. And until, I guess, we see trailers, gameplay of this next installment, which probably won't be until sometime next year, I guess it's best to just remain in that skeptical territory. Throughout the last month or two, Helldivers 2 has really defined the video game industry. It kind of feels like it came out of the middle of nowhere, but it is one of the most successful live services of at least the last couple of years. And for Sony, it really is, it feels like their only success story in this specific area or this genre, this type of game that they definitely want to have a lot more success in in the future, but that remains to be seen. Now, Helldivers 2 has created some controversy, I suppose. I guess we could use that word with how committed some players are to the in-game world and the lore and such so much so it has led to toxicity and we have articles like this coming from polygon for some hell divers two players the that type of word role play has gone too far they talk like we're actually soldiers now one major portion of this article which has raised some eyebrows is specifically on this activists accuse hell divers two developers of silencing them after they attempted to push propaganda into the game. See, you gotta want, uh, you gotta understand one thing. Outside of the United States, maybe Canada, England, Australia, a lot of these other, let's just say, different parts of the world, they don't ha agree necessarily with the same politics we have. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, or they're not as invested into it, say, as like an Overwatch or even Insomniac games. But there is an expectation from, I say, a sliver of the audience that they always have to have that support. And it is a little bit ridiculous and not understanding, especially because uh, Arrowhead Studios, they are a Swedish game developer, not an American game developer or anything of that sort. But regardless, this article perfectly paints out the, the issue. It says, numerous activists spoke with Polygon and accused developers uh, Arrowhead Game Studios of silencing them. One activist going by the name of that told the outlet, the problem here isn't actually the that, those are an unfortunate fact of life that can never, never be fully eradicated. The problem is that Arrowhead's official spaces have made the deliberate decision to silence voices under the guise of banning any political discussion as if people's identities are political, and as if the game was not created and marketed as a heavy-handed piece of political satire. The reason why they're trying to get away from this is because it just leads to lots of anger, because there's one person on one side who agrees with that, and then the other with that. And Again, there's just an expectation, especially from these... Uh, I guess you'd say those who live in the West that they have to get this type of support from every single game developer while Arrowhead just wants to avoid any of that discussion. They just want people concentrating on the gameplay, concentrating on the game. But there is an argument from this individual and many others that you can't separate it from. Uh, because, again, the game is a political satire. But it continues on. Polygon's uh, reporter also claimed that an individual named Wendy demanded pride flag capes be added to the game in the official Discord server after numerous gamers told her to keep the propaganda away. She changed her profile to uh, that flag. And then the writer then detailed after posting a long message in the official Helldivers 2 Discord detailing the events and asking for proper moderation. She was timed out for 24 hours. Her message was deleted and another swarm of people DM'd her. And it continues that those who are on the opposing side, they also ended up getting timed out. A number of players in the game's Steam forums have indicated they were kicked from the game's Discord for opposing that type of propaganda in the game. And the article just goes on to point out the frustration from both sides, those who want it and those who don't want it, with them being banned. And pretty much Arrowhead is just taking an apolitical stance. They want to avoid any of that discussion. They just want people concentrating on the actual game, which I personally think is perfectly fine. And that is how a lot of games have and probably should go about it, just because it leads to lots of, well, chaos like we are seeing right now. But Helldivers 2 is, again, still one of the big success stories of 2024. And let me know your thoughts on everything that we did discuss today. A lot going on in the video game industry, a lot that we have to catch up on. But uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts on all the stories down below. Leave a like if you did enjoy this video. Consider subscribing for a lot more videos like this. And I'll see you later.